Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, welcome. My name is Mark Button. Can you hear me? <laughs> no, of course. My name is Mark Button. I'm the uh, new dean of the College of Arts and Sciences here at the University at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, and um, it's really my pleasure and honor to be able to introduce to you today Dr. Bruce Pauly, uh, Professor Emeritus of History at the University of Central Florida, but an alum, longtime Nebraskan. Loyal Cornhusker. Uh, so, and I'm, I'm sure he doesn't really need much of an introduction from me, but let me just tell you a few things here. Uh, uh, Dr. Pauly was born and raised here in Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, attended public school here. He holds degrees from Grinnell College, the University of Nebraska, and the University of Rochester. Uh, he has taught at the College of Worcester in Ohio, the University of Nebraska Lincoln, the University of Wyoming, and then for 35 years at the University of Central Florida. Uh, as many of you know, he's written numerous works, um, uh, six books, three of which have been translated into German. Uh, he's the author of Hitler, Stalin, and Mussolini, Totalitarianism uh, in the 20th Century, and From Prejudice to Persecution, The History of Austrian Anti-Semitism, uh, the latter of which won two national book awards. Um, he's written numerous other works. His, his most recent book I just saw as we were walking in, um, we'll uh, encourage you to take a look at that, uh, Pioneering History on Two Continents, an autobiography, uh, was published in 2014 by the University of Nebraska Press. Uh, he's an amazingly decorated and awarded uh, historian. Uh, he's received the highest award for scholarship of the Austrian ambassador to the United States in 2010. His other honors include uh, numerous awards for his research uh, and teaching awards, both university and college awards, 19 teaching and research grants, uh, including a Fulbright. Uh, he's earned a Lifetime Achievement Award from the University of Nebraska Lincoln and Grinnell, uh, and he's a member of numerous associations here, uh, honoring his support, his great commitment for this wonderful university uh, and the history department, including the President's Club, the Chancellor's Club, the Alumni Advisory Council, and the Department of History. On homecoming weekend, it's wonderful to be able to celebrate uh, your great generosity. It's also so apropos to have uh, Dr. Bruce Pauly here, the founder of the Pauly Lecture Series, to give the Pauly Lecture Series. So we're so thrilled by that. And we have one more award to present to Dr. Pauly. Uh, it's really a pleasure <laughs> to present you <laughs> with the History Department's first Distinguished Alumni Award oh. uh, in the department. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Nice introduction. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll put this back over here where it doesn't get lost. Yep, yep. And uh, uh, Dean Button has a busy schedule this evening, so he's probably not going to be able to stay very long because he's going to go to the country club. To <laughs> another, <a> event. <laughs> another event that we just haven't for a second. But I wanted to just say one, one more thing. Uh, um, as you know, historians have very special DNA, which makes us sensitive to thinking about how to commemorate particular events. This year is the 150th anniversary of the University of Nebraska. So about a year ago, my colleagues and I were thinking about how we could best celebrate the 150th anniversary. So we thought that we would do, or also theoretical, that we wanted to do a what we'd call a meta poly, a poly poly, right? <laughs> to have this be the, uh, the, the event tonight. And as you just heard, we've just given Bruce our first honorary, our, our first distinguished alumni award, but he doesn't know this, and I've been nagging him <laughs> forever for photographs, because our department's also starting a, a new tradition um, in uh, awarding these, these awards but also to make our department aware of his generous contributions to the department's history because he founded the Carol R. R. Pauli Symposium and lecture series for us some 20 years ago. It's the greatest, distinguished, the, the greatest speaker series we have in our department and one of the most important in the university. So we decided that we we're gonna make a plaque for him. This, this one you don't get to keep. <laughs> <laughs> Darn. This is, for us. <laughs> this is for us because we're gonna mount this to our wall uh, and we're going to create a, a sort of series of plaques for people who've made significant contributions to our department. So on behalf of the Department of History, it's a huge pleasure 
going to let you see this. <laughs> All right. Do, do I get to touch get to it? Touch oh, it. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Bruce. Well, you're very welcome. And thank you so much for your introduction. Can I go Without ahead? Without further ado, I will have Bruce, Dr. Crawley, give his talk entitled Husker Football in the Age of Reform and Progress, 1890 to 1920. Dr. Crawley. Thank you. I hope you won't be disappointed that this is not going to be just about Husker football, although there would be plenty to talk about there. But I will be, I will be getting to it. Let me uh, give you a couple of anecdotes, first of all, to say why I became interested in this history. In part, it's, I have to admit, because I really got tired of researching the anti-Semites and the Nazis uh, and war and decided I'd really like to go on to something a little more pleasant than that. Can you all hear me, by the way? Is the mic on? Is the mic on? All right. I don't know if the mic's actually on. Mm -hmm. Good? How about that? Did Any better? There we go. Ah, there we go. OK. Maybe I have to get really close to this then. Um, I hope I'm going to have a place. To my legs will stand me, uh, will stand, work for about an hour, and then after that, I might be on the floor or someplace. Okay, thank you. Uh, in, in addition to sort of rebelling against some of the topics that I've uh, previously worked on, there are a couple of little anecdotes that I'd like to uh, mention that have influenced me. A few weeks ago, I uh, drove from. Uh, from here to Grinnell, Iowa, to accept an alumni award there. And I went through the most horrendous rain to get there. And I recall that when I was a student there, starting in 1955 and up to the time I graduated in 1959, I could go to the Rock Island Depot on O Street, get on a train, get off in Grinnell and walk four blocks to my dormitory. It was the easiest thing you could possibly do. But when I went, this past year went through a terrible rainstorm. It was very dangerous. Um, another anecdote is that when my parents used to visit Marianne and me at, when we were in Laramie, Wyoming, it was a little more difficult then, but you could, you could go to Omaha and actually find a good restaurant to eat in. You couldn't in Lincoln in those days. But then they could go to the depot there in Omaha, get on a sleeping car. It would be picked up at, uh, at midnight by the Union Pacific coming through. They'd wake up in, in Cheyenne the next morning, have breakfast uh, on the train going to Laramie, and arrive fresh and sound uh, um, about 9 o'clock in the morning. You can't do those things anymore. And a hundred years ago, it's hard to imagine, we had the best public transportation system in the world, bar none. And now we've got one of the worst, I think, of, of developed countries. Nobody says any longer getting there is half the fun. It's usually a whore. And first we have, uh, you know, 100 years ago, you could literally go to the smallest town in Nebraska. Any number of times the same day, if it was big enough to have a name on a map, you could get there. Well, then the train started cutting back. And then they were, of course, replaced by interstate highway. So if you weren't on an interstate highway, you were in terrible shape. And now we've come to the age of the airplane. And if you don't live near Lincoln or Omaha, you're in bad shape. Uh, and when I see pictures on TV uh, of Los Angeles or Chicago or almost any major American city in the United States, and there are eight lanes in both directions, I have to ask myself, isn't there a better way that we can get from point A to point B why is it possible we've gone so far backwards? In 1940, you could go from New York City to Chicago in 16 hours. Now, 
you can go, how long do you think? 16 hours. Since 1940, we've made no progress there. And then another incident that kind of inspired me to do this topic was Marianne and I were walking around an old neighborhood in, in Fort Collins, near which we live in the summer and fall. And uh, we stood in front of this uh, very old house. Well, not terribly old, but well over 100 years old. We looked up and saw a lady who looked to be, I guess, about the age I am now, something like that. I'm 82, almost. And we said, that's a, that's a nice house you have there. She said, yes, I was born here 100 years ago. And my mouth dropped open. I said, uh, do you mind if I bring a colleague of mine from Colorado State University and interview you? And she was delighted to do that. So we went back the next day. And we had about an hour and a half long conversation, at the end of which I asked her, do you think people today are any happier than they were when you were young? She could remember the sinking of the Titanic. So I think she was born probably about 1905. Her answer was, at first, an emphatic no. We're no happier today than when she was young. But then she thought a little bit and she said, but I do like the automatic washing machine. <laughs> There's a good reason why Mondays used to be called wash days, because it took the whole day. And Tuesday was ironing day. So that got me to thinking, what progress have we made over the last 100 years? And some, in some areas, I think we definitely have made progress. But in other areas, we've gone backwards. And transportation is, is just one of them. So anyway, that's what I want to talk about to begin with before I get to um, uh, Nebraska football. Because this, this is a story about progress and reform. Sometimes I think we take two steps forward and then not just one step backward, but a step and a half backward. More recently, I think we're going three steps backwards. So um, I'd like to try to uh, mention some things that were going on between 1920, uh, 19, uh, or 1890 and 1920. Because that, those three decades, I think, were absolutely amazing at how many important changes were going on at that time. You had the 16th Amendment or uh, which uh, um, brought in the progressive income tax. That, by the way, had quite a lot to do with uh, prohibition because with the income tax, you no longer needed the tax on alcohol, which had supported the government to a large extent. Uh, the 17th Amendment, the direct election of, seven, uh, of senators. The 18th Amendment, prohibition. Uh, we think of that as, you know, all of a sudden that took place in whatever year it was, I, th I think 1920. Actually, uh, two-thirds of the states in the United States already had prohibition. It didn't happen all at once. And then you had the 19th uh, Amendment, which was women's suffrage. And that was the same kind of thing, maybe not quite like uh, a prohibition, but 13 states, unfortunately not including Nebraska, but all of them in the West had already full suffrage for women. Uh, but uh, many states had partial suffrage, where women could vote for a school board or something like that, or maybe for a, for a, um, a mayor, but they couldn't vote for uh, the president. So those things all took place. So lots of important changes. Life expectancy grew enormously during this time, 1890 to 1920, but not necessarily for the reasons that you think. It, wasn't, it, was, it had very little to do with medicine, surprisingly. What it had to do was the drastic decline in infant mortality. 
you can, you can go to almost any uh, cemetery, and I'm sure uh, the one here in, in Lincoln, if you go to old, older, the older parts, you will see the, the parents buried, and then next to them, two or three little lambs that are honoring the babies that never made it past the first, first anniversary of their birth or, or the third anniversary or something like that. Um, the population, uh, but, uh, but medicine had very little to do with it during that period. But clean water, run, clean running water had a lot to do with it, as well as learning about the germ theory of disease. Which, by the way, you would think, oh, well, everybody accepted that right off, uh, right off the bat. This was a wonderful thing. No, there were physicians who would go to a conference uh, involving, that, that included, among other things, the germ theory of disease, and they would walk out rather than listen to this nonsense about how could uh, a microscopic object like a germ cause people to get a disease and die. So resistance to change, an unwillingness to believe what other scientists have almost universally confirmed is not something that is brand new in the year 2019. There's always been a resistance to major change. Well, I, I, I won't bother to talk about the, uh, uh, the presidents uh, of that period, I, but I, I do want to mention one thing, that William Jennings Bryan, whose statue, of course, is in front of the uh, statue, our, our state capitol, was one of the three most important people of this period, 1890 to 1920, the, the whole period. He came to Lincoln in 1890. Uh, he ran for president three times. If there had been a radio in his day, many historians think that he would have been elected because he was, a, uh, he was a, just a, an absolutely barn burner of a speaker. And he had a beautiful voice and a powerful voice, which aided him in, in the time of before uh, microphones. But he didn't have the radio. He was, however, the, the first politician to whistle stop, to actually go all over the country, almost every state, delivering uh, political speeches from, from the back of a train. The last time that was done, I think, was by Harry Truman in 1952, if I, uh, if I remember uh, correctly. So he was a very, very important uh, figure. Uh, but here are some of the things that happen um, during, the, um, during this period that I think you can uh, uh, identify with and uh, immediately understand their importance. Universal compulsory education came about in the 19th century. Not, not in every state at the same time. Mississippi was the, was the last holdout. The only problem was, and well, there were many problems, I guess, but um, it didn't mean that the kids actually went to school. So even though there was a law that you were supposed to go through, it wasn't always very well enforced. Many parents objected to it because they thought their kids needed to stay at home and work, particularly if they were farmers. But it did open up, of course, lots and lots of jobs for women. Previously, teaching had been done primarily by, by men. Of course, they weren't paid like men. My grandfather graduated first in his class from Harvard uh, High School. It's not as impressive as it sounds because there were only 17 people in his class. But he was, uh, and, and school was only 10 years long. So he was, he graduated with his fellow 16-year-olds um, and was immediately offered a job. 
although he turned it down uh, in order to enter the lumber business, at which it turned out, he turned out to be pretty uh, successful. The other thing was, that was invented that turned out to be very important was the typewriter. Incidentally, most of these things I'm going to mention benefited women, at least to a considerable degree. Let me ask you this question, see how smart you are. What did you call somebody who typed? Who did you call such a person? A typewriter. A typewriter, that's right. They were a typewriter. And in Washington, D.C., there were lots of, I read in one Lincoln newspaper, lots of pretty <laughs> typewriters. Never thought of a typewriter as being pretty, but if you typed, then you were a pretty typewriter. Do you have a question? Yeah, shoot. Oh, you, you, you agree with it. <laughs> OK, <laughs> you've seen lots of pretty typewriters. <laughs> um, this was the age of the department stores were coming about. And there were jobs for, for women in that respect, too. This, uh, thanks in, in large part to Carnegie, Carnegie, you had lots of new libraries, some of which are still functioning as libraries to this very day. Uh, nursing was, was uh, becoming professionalized. Beginning about 1890, it was safer <laughs> to go to a hospital than it was to stay at home. Hospitals were places, if you went to at all, they were places to die, not to get better. But with anesthesia coming along and antiseptic, uh, antiseptic surgery, it was now safer to go to a hospital than, than not. Although it wasn't until 1950 or so that more babies were born in hospitals than were born at home. Of course, nursing became much more uh, prevalent. Um, clothing for women became much more practical than it had been. It no longer had to reach the, uh, the, the, uh, the instep of, of their foot. Um, so all these things uh, were very valuable to women even though, and, and, and even though they were poorly paid, they were a lot better off than working in a shirtwaist factory. And, and you've probably heard about the shirtwaist factory in New York City that burned to the ground in 1911, I think it was, killing 134 women who worked inside. And they, they were locked in. Uh, so to prevent them from leaving with some of the clothing, I guess. That changed a lot of things. Uh, in addition to, well, um, this was really the golden age of, of trains in many respects. As I mentioned a little while ago, you could literally go anywhere uh, by train. Uh, the, um, the mileage, train mileage throughout the United States reached its peak in 1919. Railroad mileage just within Nebraska went from 1,869 miles to 7,879 miles in 1920. In other words, we're talking about a full four-fold uh, increase in mileage. The most enthusiastically received invention of that time was what? Anybody want to take a guess at that? The electric light, light bulb. It was 12 to 15 times more powerful than a kerosene lamp. And it didn't have to, be, it didn't smell, it, uh, and it didn't have to be cleaned. So it was very, uh, very enthusiastically uh, received. You may not have thought of this, but the elevator was, the electric elevator was, uh, was invented in 1887. Of course, that didn't mean that in that same year, everybody was building skyscrapers. But by 1900 or so, and increasingly thereafter, skyscrapers were being built. Modern advertising. You, you look at uh, the newspapers of this period and going back as early as 1890, and it looks just like we used to have advertisements in newspapers. The fact that advertisers uh, uh, 
don't advertise in newspapers any longer, or, or very few do, have, has had a disastrous impact on newspapers. That's why they have shrunk in size. The average family in 1900 subscribed to three different newspapers. They were really well informed, and not just local news. Uh, they were getting international news. When it, when it came to football, the, the biggest headlines were for uh, Yale versus Princeton, or uh, something of that kind, considered really important and drawing huge crowds already at that time. Um, mass circulation newspapers, uh, magazines rather. I can remember when going to my grandparents' house in the 1950s and my grandmother, my grandfather was di had died by that time, but my grandmother subscribed to Like, Life magazine, Collier's, the Saturday, Saturday Evening Post, and Look, I think. So I could, I could read those magazines uh, forever. Uh, front porches. They've just about disappeared now, but this was the golden age of front porches, partly because, now get this, this is a hard to understand, people actually walked in those days. They went, they went for walks, and when they did, they'd go past people's front porch, and their friends would be there, and they could have a nice conversation. Nowadays, we can, we can go in our cars with our tinted glass, and with uh, our remote, we can open the garage door without even having to bother and get out and lift it ourselves. And we never have to see or speak to a neighbor. We have become uh, way less social as a society than we were 100 years ago. And it's partly because we don't have, if we have any porch at all, it's, it's in the backyard, facing the back not the front yard. If it faced, every now and then you see a porch that's in the front. Most of the time it's decorative. It's a place where you can put some cute, cutesy little chair that nobody actually sits in. It's not intended for that. And maybe there are a few potted plants to make it look all, all right, but it's not actually used the way porches used to be used. Of course, part of that was if you didn't have air conditioning, the best thing was to have a, a, a front porch. And children could play there. Um, street cars, oh my goodness, street cars. They, 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 the first electric street car uh, started in um, uh, Richmond, Virginia. The first big city to have street cars was Berlin. It came suddenly to Lincoln in 1890. And it meant that you could get from downtown Lincoln to College View in no time at all. Uh, and uh, the whole city was, was uh, covered with them. Um, automobiles, of course, came along about 10 years after the streetcars did. When I look at a picture of a Lincoln Street or Washington, D.C. or Vienna, in nine, about 1900. I feel so envious because there, there are all these streetcars, one after another, and there are no electric lights there. There don't need to be. There's no crosswalk because they're, they're, they don't need to be. You can cross anywhere you want. You do have to be a little bit concerned about uh, streetcars, but other than that, there are no cars to, uh, to worry about. Uh, interestingly enough, I ran across an article that was published about 1905 in a Lincoln paper on online, um, and uh, several doctors were discussing the advantages or disadvantages of owning an, owning an automobile. Most of them were in favor of it, thought it was a good idea. Of course, there wasn't, they didn't have to worry about too many other uh, cars getting in their way. There was one person, however, who preferred a horse and buggy. Now let's see how many horse people there are out there who can guess why anyone would prefer a horse and buggy to, a, to an automobile. Anybody know the answer to that? 
I asked a, a, a person that we know in uh, Colorado, an old friend of my wife's, uh, she knew the answer immediately because she was good with horses. This doctor could get in his buggy and tell the horse to go home, and it would, on its own, and he could go to sleep in the meantime. So you know, it wasn't, it wasn't quite as cut and dry as, as you might think. Um, bicycles. Bicycles in the, uh, in the 1890s looked almost exactly like bicycles today. Now, this is one encouraging thing that is positive. <laughs> I, I may sound awfully negative about some things, but, but bicycles have really made a comeback. When I was going to Lincoln High School uh, in, uh, from 19, what would it be, 52 to 55, you wouldn't catch a Lincoln High person riding a bicycle for anything. That, that would have been total humiliation, I guess. The idea was to have some beat up jalopy to get you to school, or if you were absolutely forced, you take a school bus. But bicycle, absolutely no way. Um, and fortunately, more and more cities, including Lincoln, are building actual special paths for them. I'm not very impressed when uh, a city paints a white line in the street and says, OK, to the right side of that, that's your bicycle path. I wouldn't feel terribly secure about that. But we are starting to build such streets. Um, movies, of course. Movies now, which were non-existent in 1900, were sec by 1920 second only to vaudeville. And in 1911, a, uh, a movie house called a palace, that's what they were called then, built the first big movie theater that could hold a, a, a thousand people. So that's, that's huge. Uh, rural free delivery began in 1901, which had a huge impact on people living on farms. It was almost like having Amazon. You could get a catalog that would be like five inches thick and would have put out by Sears Roebuck, I think another company, and you could get anything under the sun. You could, uh, uh, you could order it by mail. Uh, you could give a check to the mailman who would, who would post it. And a few days later, you would get what you wanted. So that, that uh, was extremely important, particularly uh, for people in the uh, rural areas. Mass-produced cameras. Now, Kodak came out with a camera that you didn't have to be a genius in order to use it. So people started taking pictures. They were very small pictures, but uh, very uh, simple to operate. Um, and I shouldn't forget this, but it's probably the least, <laughs> the least good, if that's the right expression, uh, development in this period was for the first time the mass production of cigarettes. You had had cigarettes before, but you had to put them together yourself so it was messy, it, it uh, took a long time, and it was costly. And most men, if they smoked, they smoked cigars uh, or pipes. But now, almost anybody could afford uh, cigarettes. And of course, they, uh, they were advertised like crazy. You go back and you look at magazines from the 1940s, you'll see what you might see one with Ronald Reagan, long before he was a president, saying, I give cartons of cigarettes to all my friends. He must have felt really good about that later on. Um, so um, that was important. Uh, immigration, of course, uh, was taking place in uh, large numbers between 1820 and uh, 1890. And not 1920 so much, because it really died down seriously during the war years. But, uh, 1890 to uh, uh, 1914 was uh, probably the biggest era uh, in terms of numbers of immigration. 
in, in our history. Um, and, and what, of course, was important was that it, they were no longer coming from the uh, traditional areas of Western and Northern Europe. Now they were coming from Eastern and Southern Europe. And it was, it was now very easy to do so. Uh, I did quite a bit of work on the history of immigration to, to uh, study what my ancestors went through. Uh, I wondered, why, why didn't they come to Pennsylvania? They came from the very same area of southwestern Germany called the Palatinate, Palatinate as those people in earlier decades, starting about 1683, came from who went to Pennsylvania, the so-called Pennsylvania Dutch. And of course, that's just a mispronunciation of Deutsch. Um, but there was a, a, a book uh, written, um, I'm afraid I've, uh, I've forgotten his name at the moment, uh, who had spent four years in uh, Pennsylvania. And he described the horror of getting there. He liked Pennsylvania once he got there. He liked Americans. He got along with them just fine. But you had to go down the Rhine River, and this was at a time when it was, uh, it bordered on uh, literally dozens of principalities, each one of which charged you for going down the river. And then when you got to Rotterdam, uh, you had to wait several days to get on the ship because ships didn't go on, didn't have schedules. They went when the winds were favorable and when they were full. And in the meantime, local people could charge them anything they want. So when Catherine the Great came along in 1783, she said, come to us and uh, we'll give you free land. We'll pay your way there. We'll, there'll be tools provided for you once you get to uh, the lower Volga. Uh, you and your descendants for all time will not be forced to uh, serve in the Russian army. Uh, I mean, boy, did that ever sound like a deal. And so my ancestors took that. But in 1788, uh, I'm sorry, um, in uh, um, 18, 1878, they came to the United States. But by that time, things had changed. You know, if you came over in the 17th century, early 18th century, if you were lucky, really, really lucky, once you got on the ship, it would take you six weeks. If you were unlucky, it could take you six months if the winds were in the wrong direction. The mortality rate was 20%. In one year, it was 1733 or something like that, it was over 30%. If you had a child seven years or younger, that child would almost certainly die on the voyage. And so you had to be really, really serious if you wanted to come to the United States, or else a criminal who had the choice of be either being executed or going to the colonies. And there were some people who preferred the colonies to being executed for some reason. But by the time, by 1878, you now had what kind of transportation? What kind of ships? You had steamships. Actually, they were high, most of them were hybrids. They, they also had sails that they could use in favorable weather. Anyway, don't want to get too detailed here. But the hardest part of the trip for my ancestors was getting from their little town called Norka to the town of Saratov, which was 30 miles away, but it took them two days to get there. The rest of the way, they could go by train, and they had what amounted to a, th a through ticket. Because once they got uh, to New York, the, the trip could uh, continue almost automatically. It wasn't very comfortable. They were usually pulled by a freight car, and the cars the immigrants went in were pretty miserable. But you could go all the way to Nebraska. You got no help from the government. But you did have, and this is what's relevant, I think, uh, nowadays, uh, you, you, you had really chain migration. We've heard a lot about chain migration. That's what you had then. But the chain was 
friends and relatives already in the United States who would loan you the money or buy you the, the through ticket all the way from your hometown to, to where you were going. But what also changed now, not so much for the Volga Germans because most of them stayed settled. They had no desire to go back to Russia. Uh, but if you were from Italy, Greece, or you were Russian, or especially a Jewish Russian, um, you, you, you wouldn't necessarily come here with the idea of staying forever. In fact, I just reviewed a, a book about uh, Austro not mostly non-German-speaking Austro-Hungarians, of whom about two-thirds planned or did return to their country of origin. This you don't read about in, in American schools. We're supposed to be a, a success story in which you make up your mind to go to the United States and everything is just hunky-dory from then on out. I, I think when uh, discussing immigration nowadays is a political subject, we should keep in mind that everybody who comes to the United States doesn't necessarily want to stay here their whole life. Uh, and it's not because you know, they hate the United States necessarily. In most of the cases, they probably don't. But many people, as they get older, get homesick for their home, what was their homeland. They want to go back and visit them. And we should think twice, I think, about, about locking them in, fencing them in, and say, no, if you leave, you know, if somehow you get, leave the country, we're not going to let you back in. We're going to build a fence and make sure that because you're undocumented, you can't come back in. So uh, that immigration story is, is interesting. Now, the Volga Germans regarded themselves as Germans, but not in the sense of adherence to Bismarck or Kaiser Wilhelm II. They had some notion that they were like Germans, similar to Germans. They had no use for Russians at all. Uh, but Lincolnites saw them as being Southern or, or Eastern Europeans, as part of this mass migration of people who couldn't be counted on to stay here forever, and who seemed very different from people who had emigrated uh, earlier. So, and they were, they were called Dirty Russians, or Dumb Russians. You know why they were regarded as dirty? I just found this out from a colleague recently. Because they worked in beet fields in western Nebraska. They take special trains out in April and work in the beet fields, and they got stained by the beets. So their hands looked dirty. And if their children seemed dumb, it was because they were with their parents from the last uh, month of the school year through the first month of the new year. So they were obviously well behind. So that's, that's worth uh, exploring. Anyway, I hope I haven't used up all my time. Now I'm finally to get around to Nebraska football. I hope I haven't bored you too much with this, this other business. I, uh, I'm not very good at, at, at higher mathematics, but I'm pretty good at arithmetic. And I, I, I did a little bit of investigating to try to figure out if arithmetic would help me understand the incredible success that the university had in football in the early days. And it came down to a couple of things, the most important of which there was, from the beginning, as there is today, only one state university. There's no Nebraska a and there's no Nebraska State University. There's just the University of Nebraska and only one major football team. So this is different from Iowa, and it's different from Kansas. It's different from Colorado and any number of other states. So that's one thing, very important. The other thing was that from the beginning, 
the university was located in a capital city, which in, meant a, an increased population. If you, if you compare the population of Lincoln with Manhattan, Kansas, or Lawrence, Kansas, or Ames, Iowa, you will, and I won't bother you with statistics right now, but you, you will find that Lincoln was a much bigger city. Many, by several times, three or four times, Manhattan had, when they first played Nebraska, they, they had like 3,500 uh, people at a time when Lincoln had over 40,000. And in the, the first six games we played this with them, uh, let's see, we won all six, scored 189 points to their 12. Gives you some idea. And I can just go right down the list. When, when we had, um, when we had 43,000, KU, uh, I mean, um, Lawrence had 9,000, uh, Ames had 10,000, and, and so on down the line. There was one team, however, we played regularly, and they beat the tar out of us almost every time. You know what that what team that was? Minnesota. Now think about it. Where's Minnesota, the University of Minnesota? Minneapolis, St. Paul. So where we had forty-three thousand people, just Minneapolis, not counting St. Paul, but Minneapolis alone had two hundred and three thousand people. And if I'm not mistaken, for many years until Arizona State and UCF passed it up. UCF, where I taught for 35 years, now has 68,000 students in a metropolitan area of 2 million. Um, but uh, so Minneapolis with St. Paul had uh, probably four or 500,000 people. Uh, and almost certainly the uh, largest university in the country. I haven't been able to, trail, uh, tra uh, to um, chase that down. But that's got to do something uh, from the fact that um, the first time we played them, they won, two, they won 10 and we won two. Um, what is, is, is very uh, interesting about the, the study I do, I've done is how much it was uh, concerned about injuries. And this is part of why this belongs in this larger picture of progress and reform. Because football needed reform. There were a lot of injuries. And this was at a time, by the way, that we didn't know anything about strokes. There's never a mention about strokes when they're talking about injuries. They're, they're talking about broken uh, arms and, and legs and missing teeth and things of that kind. And, and maybe 13 or 15 fatalities. Most of which, by the way, were of high school students. Only two or three per year would be of a, of a university student. But you know how they, uh, they came about? One, uh, one writer I saw described it this way. It was like two trains colliding head on against each other. You had these mass for formations uh, that, that, that would uh, clash. Um, and, and, and then there'd be this huge pile and uh, if, if you could, could pull your teammate who had the ball by some strap, you could, you could do that. So the pile would keep getting larger and larger. And that's where most of the injuries uh, occurred. Uh, I recall, uh, and you probably do too, it was either two years ago or four years ago that Northwestern University came here. And we won the game with a Hail Mary pass. The very last play of the game, as time was running out. And there was this huge pileup 
on top of the poor fellow who call, caught the ball. And the smartest guy on the field was the quarterback who ran in the opposite direction, who could get away from any pileup uh, as quickly and as thoroughly as, as he possibly could. Well, the uh, solution, uh, well, part of the problem was, was this. Um, keeping all these reforms uh, straight is, is, is not easy. But it, it began with the notion that you had three downs to make five yards. That's what it was until something like 1905. Uh, so that means you only have to uh, gain about uh, five feet per play. Which meant if you could just keep grinding it out, grinding it out, grinding it out, you'll get one first down after another. I don't think we would put up for that. I mean, football was, was regarded as very popular then. I mean, there's no, no question about a lack of popularity. But it's hard for us to imagine a game like that continuing. It was hard to even see the ball. And it was made harder by the fact that it was legal to take the ball and tuck it under your jersey until 1916. So he had no idea who even had the ball. Uh, but then there was a reform. Again, I'm not going to search through my notes and look for the exact year. I think it was 1906, actually. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt was very concerned uh, about the uh, injuries. Some people think uh, that he was on the verge of, uh, of banning football. Uh, preachers, by the way, uh, were uh, often very much opposed to football. Thought it was just a brutal, brutal sport. It was worse than price, price fighting. There is no chance, I think, that that Roosevelt was in favor of abolishing the game because he was the president who was all in favor of vigor, you know, training, being strong. Uh, so there's no way that he would have done that. But he did want to reform football so there wouldn't be so many uh, injuries. And so one of the things that was done was instead of five yards in three plays, you had to do uh, 10 yards in four plays, which increased by 50% uh, the number of yards you needed. Instead of gaining five feet you, uh, in three plays, you had to gain seven and a half feet, or 50% more, in, uh, in four plays. So that being, brings into the question, can you keep up this just grinding out, grinding out? It's not going to be so easy to get a first down any longer. And by the way, the teams that won in those days, especially before the four down business came along, were almost always the heavier team. Almost always the newspaper would say, the thus and such a team outweighs us by 20 pounds per man or 10 pounds per man, or we out them by such and such a figure, taking the whole team into account. And by the way, um, although there were huge disparities from one football player to another, uh, th there were figures for one particular year in which the smallest player weighed, for Nebraska, 139 pounds. And the heaviest player weighed 178 pounds. It's almost hard to even imagine, even for a high school team <laughs> any longer. And we had a black player by the name of Flippin, uh, who was the captain. Uh, and he, he was regarded as huge because he weighed 200 pounds. So that was, that was just beyond uh, uh, belief. And the newspapers, they didn't, they, they talked about beef. They loved the, maybe it's because we're, there's a lot of beef in Nebraska, but you know, how much beef does this other team have? Well, beef didn't become quite so important any longer. How are you going to get those 10 yards in four plays? The answer seemed to be through passing. Uh, uh, some coaches, by the way, not all of them, but some coaches were very leery about that 
they thought this is too much like basketball. Some, some of the early coaches, by the way, all, nine out of our first 10 coaches came from Ivy League schools. The first three or so just were coaching for the fun of it, I guess, because they didn't get paid. When they finally got paid, they had to do basketball as well as football and maybe some other sport as well. Um, but anyway, some coaches thought that passing was kind of for sissies, you know, and a running game that was only running, that was called straight football. So anything else was, you know, kind of crooked. Ben, now I'm going to ask you a question. Since we have an audience and uh, uh, an expert in the audience, I keep fearing that I'm going to see something. He's going to jump in and say, that's not true. You know, you're way off base. But fortunately, he's a gentleman. And uh, he'll tell me later, I'm, I, I, I'm sure. Um, but now I've gotten so carried away, I can't remember what the question was. <laughs> so it's just maybe just as well. Oh, I know. What is scientific football? You know, there was regular football, and then there was scientific football. And I, I guess to, the only thing I can figure out, it meant that you actually had a play in advance. So just instead of, OK, let's just all rush forward. But let's kind of stop and figure this out, what we're actually supposed to do. Is, is that how you would interpret that term? I think that's good. Yeah, OK, good. Yeah, if it's not, you can tell me afterwards. All right. Um, anyway, so, so that's kind of fun. But, you know, they, they were very leery about introducing this new thing called passing. So they had all sorts of restrictions on it at first. You can only pass if you move, if the, if the quarterback moves from where he gets the ball five yards either to the right or five yards to the left. And so you had, you had lines paralleling the sidelines which must have been, this was enforced for several years, it must have been a nightmare for umpires to figure out, have they moved four and a half yards or five yards? Uh, so that was one restriction. And another restriction was you couldn't throw it for more than 20 yards. Uh, it's like telling a, a, a punter, oh, we want you to punt, but make sure it doesn't go more than 20 yards. Um, but one reform that really helped a lot was that you could throw a pass into the end zone, and that would count. So that, that opened things up a lot. Be, be, because before that, you could, you know, if you couldn't do that, you could bring all of your players right up to the front and uh, right up to the line of scrimmage, and it would be really hard to get those last five yards or so. Um, and now, for the first time, speed becomes important. Beef alone won't do it. You need to have at least some players who are fast and, and can outrun the opposition. And you made things easier for them because uh, there was no, there was no, you couldn't interfere with the receiver unless you were trying to intercept it. You had a rule called roughing the passer. So you had to be careful about that. And you also had in 1906, I think, uh, you, couldn't, um, you couldn't insult the other side, the other uh, uh, team. You couldn't insult the officials. So these were all, all nice things, I think. Um, uh, the penalty, there was a penalty for roughing the passer, as I said. Um, I wish there were time to talk about this series with Notre Dame, but we played Notre Dame, uh, let's see how many times, 15 times. There were seven wins and seven losses and one tie. And those games were sold out. They were just fanatical. And Nebraska won the first game 20 to 19 because Notre Dame missed an extra point at the end. I would love to see that game today because it, it sounds very much like what we would still enjoy. By the way, uh, the two other points I want to make before we close. A whole team, the entire team, including substitutes, had about 15 players. <laughs> 
and there were very strict limitations on, on, on substitution. And so these 15 guys played the whole game, offense and defense. But the games didn't last as long. Uh, it was about two hours for, for the whole thing. If it was a really long game, maybe two and a half hours. Uh, and it's interesting, in playing Notre Dame 15 times, all but two of the games were in Lincoln. And I think it was because Lincoln could draw the crowds. By an, for, for the most part, uh, the, the fans turned out. After a big game, there would be a parade down uh, O Street. Interestingly enough, uh, there would be uh, a banquet afterwards, including the other team. And, and our notion of complimenting the opposing team goes back to the beginning. A few years ago, I uh, went to a Nebraska UCF game. This was when UCF was just really <laughs> nothing. Um, and um, I, I, um, I was very smart. I carried a UCF cap in one hand and a Nebraska cap in the other hand. So if I would run into a UCF person who knew me, I'd quickly put my UCF hat on. If I ran into a Nebraska fan, I'd hide the UCF uh, cap. But one, one guy, a total stranger, who saw the UCF cap I was carrying, and he came up to me and said, oh, I'm so glad that you're here. We're loving you. Hope, hope you have a good time and all of that. And then later that week, I happened to see our president in, in a, a restaurant. And I knew that he, he went to all of the away, away games as well as the home games. And I asked him, how do they treat you when you were in Lincoln? And I'm serious. I'm quoting word for word. I've never been so well treated as anywhere that I've been. That makes me very proud that we've had that kind of a tradition that goes back to the beginning. And I certainly hope it continues. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>I survived even without a high chair. <laughs> well, I want to, again, thank Bruce and his family uh, who have come here uh, since I've been here for 19 years. Bruce has been here every year for every talk. Uh, he has been a mainstay for our department. Our department has been enhanced by your presence. We really appreciate you. We really yeah. do. And I really want you to know how thankful we are. Yeah. And thank you for your time. I, I appreciate your appreciation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.